What I'm be talking about tonight is the general issue of marine debris. A little bit of background, what is it? I mean, certainly right now it's in the news a lot, um, has been. Uh, many of you have probably heard about some of the uh, more common things that are kind of out in the news about the issue. Um, but it's also a common everyday problem that impacts um, shorelines as close as, you know, within maybe a few stones throw, maybe down a single stones throw of where we're sitting right now. Um, so kind of go through that and then talk a little bit about um, the tsunami marine debris issue specifically. We have background, I said local debris, and then JTMD. Uh, when you work in the government, you learn to use a lot of acronyms. Um, there's a joke that NOAA has, an, uh, is, that's kind of our, our thing, we're the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. Um, <laughs> however, uh, there's just a lot of acronyms, and our newest one is JTMD, Japan Tsunami Marine Debris. Um, so hence, that's why it's on the screen. Yeah. So, um, and you, what you see it right is pictures of various marine debris issues. Um, these three are derelict crab pots, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and here you have abandoned and derelict vessels, which really gives an illustration of the wide range of the issue. So first, a little bit about us, the NOAA Marine Debris Program, um, kind of why I'm standing here instead of somebody else <laughs> uh, to talk to you about this issue. So. Um, we were established in 2005, so we're a pretty young program, um, and we were established by an act of Congress. Um, sounds very majestic, but um, what, we, what we do is it's the Marine Debris Research Prevention and Reduction Act. Well, actually, you know, sometimes acts can be a little bit odd and not be totally descriptive. This one actually is, does a pretty good job of saying what it is we do. Um, we do research. So marine debris is bad. It's in the water. Um, what is it? We'll talk about that in a second. But you know, it's pretty much anybody can agree. There's not a, a large group of people that would say that marine debris in the water is a good thing. But how bad is it? What are the impacts of it? Um, what is that really doing to the environment? That's something that's important to know so that we can better prioritize um, our actions of how to clean it up. How do we clean it up? By removing it, so reducing it in the, env in the environment. Um, and that tells us a bit about how much there is. So when you go out to a beach and you find out how much debris there was, that gives you a piece of information about what's not only how much is there, but what is there? Is it plastics? Is it um, fishing gear? What's there? And together with your research about you know, what's the impacts and then your information from what you grabbed off the beaches, you can then go and try to prevent more marine debris by saying, going to people and really explaining, here's what's out there and here's what it's doing. Um, and so preventing behaviors, because a lot of marine debris does come from um, people's choices on a day-to-day -day basis. So. That's kind of our mission. Um, we have a regional structure, so I'm the Alaska Regional Coordinator, um, and happy to be so. It's a great, great, and great big state. Um, so I work quite a bit on, on projects in Alaska um, throughout the state, and you can check it out more information out on our website, which I will refer to frequently because that is how things go. Websites are certainly a very important tool for us in our communication. So, what is marine debris? Um, how many people in the audience have heard the term marine debris before? Okay. A majority. All right. Well, that's good to know. So we're, we're on our way. Um, so this is the official definition that we've come up with. A few things to highlight in this. So we'll kind of read it out loud. Any marine debris is any persistent solid material that is manufactured or processed, and directly or indirectly, so a lot of ores, intentionally or unintentionally disposed of or abandoned in the marine environment or the Great Lakes. Important to note because they are very big bodies of water um, and have actually a marine significant marine debris problem. There are a lot of efforts in that area. Um, just a project that we're working on now. Um, but key thing there is persistent. Um, doesn't break down so over a long period of time. Um, so you know a piece of lumber, while certainly in the water, um, in a log or even a two by four, um, certainly could be a problem. But it's going to break down over time. Um, you know, and so certainly persistent are objects that tend to stick around for a longer period of time. We'll get more into that in a minute. Um, but one of the key points here is all these ores really point out that marine debris gets in the water in a lot of different ways. Um, it can be accidents. People can, you know, s there are container spills um, frequently. You know, that happens. A container just comes off in a storm. Um, you can have, um, you know, a fisher fisherman can snag a net on the bottom and totally unintentionally. There can also be intentional, you know, improper disposal. People can dump stuff overboard when they shouldn't. And then you can also have, um, you know, tragic and large-scale events like the tsunami that really are um, just be can be acute individual introduction events. Um, but a lot of different marine debris can get out in the water, and at the top you see some images of what that what that can be. So marine debris, once it's out in the water, what does it do? Um, well, this example is some of the impacts that you see for marine debris. So starting at top left, you have um, those are fishing nets. 
um, in the Gulf of Alaska. So image from Gulf of Alaska Keeper, that's a group that does a lot of cleanup in Alaska. Um, so you see there fishing nets that can smother habitat. Um, to give you an example of some of the, some of the challenges with, s um, with debris, I mean, these fishing nets, are you can find them through, throughout a lot of shorelines, and especially in Alaska, um, just based on um, patterns and oceans and currents. We'll talk about that more in a minute. You can also have entanglement, kind of a grisly image. I apologize, and I know many, some of you are eating dinner, but um, you know, certainly you can have fishing gear that can entangle um, different species. Um, you can also have ingestion impacts, which I didn't picture here for uh, reasons that I did figure there might be some dinner, but um, seabirds and others um, can ingest small pieces of debris and actually have an, a hazard in that way. Um, here you see another image. This is actually from Puget Sound, so right locally, um, that shows um, just the how many different species can be caught in fishing nets. This is one that's being recovered from the bottom um, of Puget Sound. And that also have human health and safety hazards. So this is actually a NOAA vessel out in the open Pacific that was tang that um, ta tangled its prop in a large-scale line and was disabled for a few hours. Luckily, the weather was fine, so there was no no impact to the vessel. And everyone got got out of it safe. But um, there can also be issues for human health too. Um, it can actually cause uh, safety issues for vessels. And at bottom right is a derelict crab pot. So um, derelict crab pots can continue to fish. So crab pots are you know people drop them over the side. The, the idea is that they go to the bottom, sit on the bottom for a while. You come back and retrieve them after having left them for a period of time, and they're full of crab, ideally. Sometimes not. Um, however, if you, um, if you have too short of a line or if it gets cut, that crab pot's on the bottom. And what's a crab pot designed to do? Catch crab. Um, and it can still do that for a significant period of time after it's been lost. And so that's a phenomenon we call ghost fishing, um, the concept that a piece of gear like a net or, or a pot that's designed to catch something will continue to do its job even if it's not being actively used by as it was designed. Um, this is just a quick graphic that shows kind of where we've done projects. So um, really, I mean, the key point is we're one program. The marine debris community is a whole lot of groups. Um, locally here, we'll talk about a few Northwest Straits Initiative. Um, uh, certainly the Ocean Conservancy does a lot of work. Um, many of you have probably heard of Algalita that does um, open ocean research. Um, there's a lot of different groups that are involved. These are just a sampling of our projects, but it shows just the scope of where marine debris is an issue um, throughout, throughout the United States, which is our focus being a U.S.-based program. So with that, kind of a general introduction to the marine debris issue, I want to talk more about kind of local marine debris, what's going on here. And we'll talk more about tsunami marine debris in a minute. But wanted to kind of focus in that it's not just a, you know, an international issue or a faraway issue that's coming this way now, um, but it's an everyday problem. Um, first, beach cleanup. Certainly, as we've talked about, marine debris gets in the water from a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different methods. And there are a lot of groups that are out there doing cleanups and using that data um, to better understand what shows up and better inform prevention efforts, outreach and education, so that people can understand the impact that their decisions have. Um, these are community-based and community-driven, which is a really important thing. Um, you know, People often have the best understanding of both what the issues are in their own communities and how to address them. Um, so Washington Coast Savers is a group that does an Olympic Coast-wide cleanup every year, typically in April. Um, and, and um, does an amazing job of um, leveraging community volunteers to go out and clean. This is an image from um, the 2012 cleanup, um, and that's an annual event. And uh, we partnered with them early on, and they've been an ongoing and really great partner um, in, in how they leverage a lot of volunteers and a lot of work to get a lot done. Um, international Coastal Cleanup is, an, is, as it says, International Coastal Cleanup. I, that kind of not something you don't really need to explain. But... Um, what it, what it means, though, is it's a day where the idea is that people around the world are cleaning up beaches and collecting data on similar cards. So volunteers from around the world are going out, um, hundreds of thousands on total. And so it's a really impressive thing. This is an image from last year's event at Alki Beach um, that uh, we were partnered with with REI and Teva. I always said Teva. I was corrected. Um, it's Teva, apparently, the sandal company. Um, so I still say Teva sometimes, though. Um, but in any case, this is an event that every year goes out and does significant amounts of cleanup. Another, of another thing that to keep in mind is so going underwater. Um, you look out at Puget Sound and, you know, certainly some days it looks a little bit dirty, but um, certainly there's an element of marine debris that's out of sight, out of mind. Um, things that if you don't see them, you wouldn't expect them to be there. Um, these are derelict fishing nets that are removed from the bottom. And actually, this is a side-scan sonar image 
that shows suspended nets on the bottom. This is actually a pretty new technology that's being pioneered right here in Puget Sound um, by local groups um, to use sonar to detect um, fishing nets, which previously hadn't been done. But you see here, to date, over 4,000 derelict fishing nets have been removed just from Puget Sound. Um, and a lot of those are legacy nets. So there's from old fisheries that are no longer active, but it shows how long these nets that are made of um, long-lasting plastics can survive um, and persist on the bottom. A lot of times they're snagged on, f on rock phenomena um, or rocky outcroppings. So you can see that they, they um, can really cause a lot, of, a lot of damage, especially if they're, f if they're suspended vertically. You can get a lot of entanglement from fish or even seabirds that get caught in them on, on, on their way through. Another example is crab pot removal. So this is off the coast of Oregon, so still relatively local, Pacific Northwest. But these are um, spots where there actually ha where crab pots were removed off the coast of Oregon. And there have been um, hundreds and hundreds more removed in Puget Sound as well. Um, it's an ongoing um, challenge actually nationwide. So um, Chesapeake Bay out near Washington, D.C., you know, Virginia, Maryland, there's been significant efforts there removing thousands of crab pots. There have been efforts in Puget Sound off the coast of Oregon um, and even in California too. But these crab pots are removed using sonar, grappling gear, um, many different methods, and there's been a lot of pioneering work to do that um, throughout. But this is trying to address that ghost fishing issue um, that these crab pots can cause. And I should point out that, um, you know, sometimes people can say, well, you know, so it's the fishermen, the fishermen are losing their nets or, you know, not being careful. But fishermen are often some of our best partners in identifying where crab pots go, go overboard and how, and how to retrieve them and identifying the best methods. Um, so in this case, it actually we partnered with fishermen um, in Oregon um, to help pay for a little bit of their fuel, and they went out and helped remove the debris. So um, it can, those would be some of our most valuable partners. So with that, talking about kind of local things, I know that kind of a hot topic issue is the Japan tsunami marine debris issue. Um, I imagine probably many of you have seen this in the news. So I want to give some background on, on this, and we'll talk more about other things, and certainly in Q&A we can get into a whole lot of other issues, the, great, the garbage patch, which talk, we'll reference briefly in this, um, and other topics, but I wanted to go through this since it is kind of a, a hot issue at the moment, and certainly one that we're spending a lot of time working with, especially in my area in Alaska. So first, the event itself. Um, tsunami was caused by a 9.0 magnitude earthquake that struck on March 11th, 2011. Um, this triggered a wave that reached over 130 feet high at its highest point. Um, so a very significant event. Um, it inundated over 217 square miles of shoreline. Um, so, you know, you're talking about a very large area again. But I think the most important thing to remember is that this was first and foremost a human tragedy. So before we were talking about this as a marine debris issue, as an environmental issue, as a, you know, shoreline impact issue, which are all very valid points and very valid things to be concerned about. Um, this was a human tragedy that impacted and irre irrevocably impacted thousands of lives. Um, also in the damage beyond the lives taken was also hundreds of thousands of buildings that were destroyed. Um, and those buildings, as you can see here, um, were destroyed on land and then also debris was brought on shore. Um, total debris um, that was on land um, was about 22 million tons was the estimate. As the wave retreated, it brought that debris offshore with it. So what you see here at right is an image from the U.S. Navy that was heavily involved in the immediate recovery and response from two days after the tsunami of the debris that was offshore. So while it destroyed things on land, it brought stuff back offshore as well. Japanese government estimates that about 5 million tons of debris was brought offshore, and about 70% of that sank very shortly thereafter. And that aligns with our data and experience from other events, the hurricanes Katrina and Rita, where you had a large storm surge come ashore and then retreat, bringing debris with it. Uh, that was my first project when I came into the program. And also the um, tsunami that struck American Samoa in 2009. So roughly 70% sank, leaving about 1.5 million tons floating in the water, based on the estimates. Well, what 1.5 million tons of what? Well, this image does give a good job of showing of, uh, the, that example. So. You see an overturned vessel, roof of a house, a lot of woody construction debris, um, flowy floats and buoys, fishing gear. And if you zoom into this image, which you can't hear, but um, you can in the original, you see also a lot of just consumer debris, um, you know, plastic bottles, water bottles, um, you know, lo little individual containers, that sort of thing. 
and you can see this debris is behaving differently already. You know, some of it's sitting relatively low on the water, some sitting very high on it, some sinking. Um, so it's it behaves differently. So the question became immediately afterwards, you know, where's this debris going to go? Here you see more examples of just kind of the type of debris. And you see these are offshore Japan in October, November of 2011, so months later. The thing to point out is now you're starting to see debris and they're spread out. So as opposed to being all together, you see a boat on its own. There's nothing around the boat. You see fishing gear, but there's nothing right immediately around it. And that's because as debris is in the water, um, it's acted upon differently by wind and currents. So something that sits high in the water is going to move not only in a different direction, but also at different speeds than something that sits low in the water. So we'll see the impact of that in a second. So going back in time a tiny bit to right after the event, this is an image from, again, one or two days after the tsunami, and this is from a higher altitude. You can see the streaks and patches of debris, and these were big enough to where you actually see them from satellite imagery for the first three to four weeks after the tsunami. Um, however, after about four weeks, so by April 14th, um, you know, just a little bit over a month after the event, you could no longer see the debris from the satellite. Well, it hadn't just all gone away. But it had dispersed. It had spread out. As we saw in those images, debris, th that's just the, the way that the ocean behaves. It spreads things out over space and time. And so uh, we no longer could see it. So the question became understanding where is it going to go next. And to understand that, a key point is windage, a term that is kind of an uh, interesting thing. But basically what you think about it is how much the wind impacts a, an object when it's in the water. So it's a combination of how much area there is above the water for the wind to push against and how much there is below the water to hold it back. So when you put it together, it kind of makes sense. So it's a combination of the sail area and the drag. So basically look at the same vessel. Yes, this is uh, you know certainly a very crude drawing, um, but you know higher windage and it's lower if it's under the, if it's under the water because you have more drag, less area. So if you think about this, this is our, our modeling output that you can find on our website. This is an effort that we did to actually model where's the debris going to go and when's it going to get there. And you see that lower, um, lower windage objects that sit on the water are going to move more slowly and also in different directions versus higher windage objects. Um, so this output shows, and it's kind of a, a grainy image, I apologize for that, but what you see here is this captures all the area that debris could be um, in the Pacific across all the different windage values. Um, so from 1 to 5%, basically some everything from a buoy or a float that sits very high in the water to um, a net or something that sits very low in the water and it's just going to move much more slowly. So what this shows is basically the higher windage objects could have arrived and in fact did, as you'll see in a minute, as early as the winter of 2011-2012, um, so this past winter, whereas the lower windage objects, things that sit lower in the water, are still, the most of those would still be out in the, out in the Pacific. But when you're looking at this, you're looking at trying to model how debris is going to move over the entire Pacific Ocean. So if you think about kind of in our daily lives how we interact with models, weather forecasts are based on models. So I know, you know, for most of us, if you look at the 10-day forecast, you're not going to plan exactly what you're going to wear in 10 days based on the 10-day forecast because uh, there's a bit of uncertainty there. You, don't, you know, it might be right, it might be wrong. Things change. Um, you know, you're probably going to wait till the day before to really plan exactly what you're going to wear and, how, and whether you're going to bring a coat or not. Um, similarly, as you look in, you know, at, at the whole entire Pacific Ocean and trying to predict currents and winds over a period of years, you're talking about there's a significant uncertainty as far as what's going to happen. And so that's why this has a significant area of where the debris um, could be, and that's w one of the challenges of predicting it. So one of the other area things we're working to do is actually report sighting. So we're asking people from both shoreline users as well as um, vessels, so whether it's shipping, um, coast guard, fishing fleets, to report in when they see something unusual out in the water. So what you see here are some of those reports. These were actually two of our confirmed um, sightings, so objects that we could really definitively trace back to the tsunami. Um, so these are from back in the fall of 2011. These are two vessels where actually they were registered to the provinces where the, where the tsunami struck. So that way we could actually fingerprint them back and say, yep, they came from the area. Um, similarly, the fishing vessel that um, was sunk off of uh, the coast of Alaska, maybe many of you heard of that back in March um, and April of, two of, this, of this year, 2012. Um, so these objects could all be traced back. However, these yellows represent potential objects. Well, one of the challenges is 
while many of you have probably heard of the you know the large quantities of debris that are washing up in Alaska and Washington coast, Oregon coast, you know obviously the dock that's shown up, you know that's a confirmed object, but it's difficult to walk down the shoreline and say then clearly identify whether an object is from the tsunami. So this uh, gives you an example. So this image here is from um, Hinchinbrook Island in Alaska, um, small island. This person took a picture of this buoy. It arrived roughly in the time frame that you would expect for a buoy that was floating high in the water. So it fits the profile. This buoy is representative of one that showed up in Washington um, less than a month after the tsunami. So no matter how fast the wind was blowing, it couldn't have traveled that distance in a month. So the challenge is, on the surface level, they look roughly the same. So how do you say which one is definitely from the tsunami or not? So that's the challenge is that while a lot of the debris that's arriving certainly fits the profile, and so it's, it's likely that it's tsunami debris, um, it's very difficult to say whether any one object is absolutely from the tsunami unless you have a unique identifier, like something that says it's registered there, you know it, you've got a name. Some of the things that have been identified and confirmed are vessels, but also actually in kind of a point and reminder of the event itself, um, sports equipment. So the soccer ball that showed up in Middleton Island in, in the Gulf of Alaska, um, a volleyball that showed up in Sitka, Alaska, or sorry, not in Sitka, but in um, Seward, Alaska, um, and then also a basketball that showed up in Southeast Alaska, um, where it had, you know, many of you who, you know, in school, the schools write their names on the, on the balls um, to be able to keep track of them, make sure no one's taking them home. Same idea. Um, and so that's something that I think it's a poignant reminder. Um, in the positive news, though, and, and certainly doesn't diminish the tragedy of the event, but um, th many of those have actually been able to re be repatriated um, back to the kids who lost them because um, they have their name on them and they actually wrote a track down. So they've sent back, um, I think, three or four of those back to their original families. We're pretty excited to have them because um, in many cases they lost you know, pretty much everything. So these stars on the map represent another effort, though, which is these are monitoring sites. So the concept is even though if we can't tell if an object, you can't walk down the beach and say tsunami debris, not tsunami debris, tsunami debris, not tsunami debris, what we can do is by collecting data on a regular basis, we can construct a sense of what's normal. So we can get in a baseline of what debris comes ashore and detect changes. So meaning, are we getting a whole lot more? Are we getting, are we getting a whole lot, maybe not a whole lot more, but are we getting different kinds of debris than we normally do? Um, so that's why we've established these monitoring sites, working with partners including National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, local nonprofits. It's really been an amazing unity effort across uh, a lot of different agencies. We have over 50 of these sites now that are collecting data on a regular basis using the same same data. And although that's kind of down in the weeds, you know, why is it so important they're all using the same form? It sounds kind of you know bureaucratic. The key thing is that gives us an apples to apples comparison, so we can say how much more debris are we getting in Alaska than we're getting in California? And we know the data was collected the same way. So it's that little thing that make a big difference in knowing what's going on. Um, certainly there are some groups that um, are doing it as part of, so U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, National Park Service, they're doing it as part of their field camps. Because um, in Alaska you can't do monitoring year round in a lot of these places. They're too remote and the weather's too extreme. And there actually are more sites out in the Aleutians. We don't have the specific points, so we didn't want to put them up because we didn't want to put them in the wrong place, certainly. Um, but there's more sites that are out in the Aleutians as well. So there's a significant amount of data being collected. So kind of in summary, uh, what do we know um, putting all this together? So first, tsunami debris added to an existing problem. Um, when the last bit of tsunami debris is cleaned up, hopefully, or washes ashore or sinks, there still will be a, a marine debris issue. Um, you know, that's unfortunately the truth based on the issue that we've, has been dealt with over time. Um, and so it added to that existing problem. Um, and so that's an important point to note. Um, so example, there's one beach in Alaska, Gore Point. I don't know if any of you have been out to the Kenai Peninsula before. Um, but in that beach, in one cleanup alone on less than a mile, um, they removed over 20 tons of debris before the tsunami. So this is in 2007, 2008. So it tells you that certainly it's the high rates of deposition, so a lot of debris showing up, isn't a new thing that's being caused by the tsunami, but it certainly is adding to it. Um, it's likely that much of the debris sank near sh off the shore of Japan, as we talked about. Debris is dispersed and not in large concentrations or fields. When you hear these numbers of millions of tons, it's really easy to think about it in terms of, uh, you know, kind of an island or a field of debris. Um, but that would make it a lot easier, um, certainly to detect and to find. But that's just the way that ocean behaves in spreading things out. Um, that's not how it is. And we've actually been working with satellite data to try to find the debris out in the open ocean, and we'll talk about that in a second, and that's been confirmed that, you know, it's not that case. 
radioactive debris? Certainly it's a question people have asked based on the fact that um, there was the Fukushima reactor incident. Um, however, we've talked with scientists from, you know, because no, and NOAA, that's not necessarily our area of specialty, but we've explored with people from the CDC, EPA, all the way down to independent and, and um, university groups as well. So across the board, and consensus is that it's highly, highly unlikely. And we can talk about that more if there are questions. Um, uh, and then also sightings. There are 10 sightings to date, um, actually 11, that we just got a confirmation um, earlier today. Um, of confirmed tsunami debris, meaning we can actually know that it definitely came from the, from, uh, from the tsunami and was a result of it. However, there are hundreds and hundreds more that have been reported in. And so the, the way uh, I think it's the best way to explain it, or a good way to explain it hopefully, is that you know, because we know that these objects are arriving, so we know buoys are showing up and that we can trace back, um, it tells you that those are, those are yeses. And then we have thousands of maybes. So some of the maybes have to be yeses. Um, but it's just a matter of we can't know exactly which ones. And from a science perspective, we can't just sort of guess. Um, we need to be able to know for sure if we're going to say yes for sure. Um, so it's basically that there's a lot of debris that fits the profile. It's likely, but we can't say for absolutely sure. Um, these are some examples of debris images from Alaska. So certainly that gives you a sense of what, what, people, are sh what, what people are noting and what's showing up. These are those black buoys that have become relatively ubiquitous as a sighting. There have been a lot of these reported. Um, also these small jerry cans, um, so small fuel containers. Um, they're either for kerosene or gasoline. And then just kind of large general floats. Um, another example are of these large floats and then this large styrofoam float. This is from Montague Island. So in the Gulf of Alaska as well. And these are islands, uh, Montague and Kayak Island, that are frequently their catcher beaches, meaning they collect a lot of debris any given year, but in this year they're collecting even more. So well, what are the actions? What's going on? Well, first detection. So these boxes represent satellite um, areas. So we're actually we're working with um, a lot of different government agencies to request high resolution satellite imagery. So something that basically could see something about the size of this table, about a meter. Um, however, when you're talking about the open ocean, that's still, if, you know, how can you see something in the open ocean when you're talking about cloud cover, the um, sea state, you know, waves, it doesn't always cooperate in letting you see something out there. It can be a pretty big challenge. To give an idea, um, the vessel that showed up off the coast of Alaska, um, if you took the Pacific Ocean and shrunk it down to the size of a football field. If you were going to try to find that vessel in that, uh, in that football field, it would be the size of two human hairs put next to each other. So you have the challenge of finding the two human hairs. You also have the challenge of where do you start on the football field exactly. So that's why we're working with modeling to be able to try to, to better understand where the debris might be so we can focus our efforts. To give you an idea, this polygon here for satellite data is 1,000 kilometers by 300 kilometers. So in scale, you can see how that's a pretty big area, and yet not that big when you're talking about the entire Pacific. Um, we're also, though, working to establish those baseline data through monitoring, as we talked about. Um, this is an image of some monitoring efforts, actually. Um, in Let's see, that one from is from, I believe, that's Kayak Island, so right there. Um, pardon, I work in Alaska a lot, so a lot of my photos are from Alaska. Um, but also we're working to then work on planning and preparedness, so working at a regional level to construct plans, so working with the individual states, because every state's different, both in terms of the debris, but also in terms of um, their response and how their agencies are structured, too. Um, so that's something that we're working at a regional level. And then communicating all of this out through the website and then through partners. And Washington Department of Ecology for Emergency Management, they've got great web resources to, exp to link, and then we're working actively with them on that. So last and certainly not least, um, what you can do. Because um, marine debris, as we said, is an everyday problem, and tsunami marine debris added to it, but, and there's certainly elements that we're looking at. So first, if you see something that's unusual, we are asking people who go out on the beaches or out on the water to report something they think is unusual. Um, local knowledge is a key thing. So we have monitoring, we're, we're collecting data. If people go out to beaches every day, especially in more remote locations, um, you know, or really they know what's normal. They've been out to the beach, if you go out to the beach every day, you know what normally shows up, and you also know what's not normal. And so we're asking people to report those in to an email address we've created just for the purpose. So all those yellow dots you saw, those red, those are all came in through that. So the Coast Guard, um, shipping vessels, um, volunteers, volunteer vessels. Actually, there's a yacht race um, from British Columbia down to Hawaii. 
they were reporting in sightings on their way and they're reporting in the men on the way back. So we're cooperating with groups kind of across the spectrum because it is just a very large target area that we're trying to find this debris in. So also we're asking people to volunteer. So that can be a cleanup and then it can also be working on kind of monitoring programs. A lot of groups are doing that. Um, so COAST is a program of citizen science, which is a, a really critical part of this where people go out and collect data on um, bird populations and um, bird patterns. Um, but we're partnering with groups like that to try to add in marine debris um, data collection as well. And then staying informed. Certainly we're learning new stuff about this every day, um, as is the whole marine debris community. As I mentioned, we're the marine debris program, and so we're very much engaged in this, but we're not the only ones. Um, we're working with agencies across, as well as nonprofits, local groups. And so staying informed about what's going on and ways to stay engaged are things that everybody can do in this.